Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, encryption and privacy took quite a beating in the wake of the Paris attacks this week, so we'll come to its defense. Your ISP, it heard you like back doors, so it put a back door in your back door. And we'll tell you about the case of the social rat. Then it's a great big batch of your questions, our answers, a rock and roundup, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 241 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on November 19th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. Oh, our live stream? Why, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You should go check it out. It's Well, pretty incredible. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Well, hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, sir. I see the uh, Tetris lamp is uh, illuminated and ready to go for a big show today. Pretty much. (laughs) You know... I don't know if I've ever forgotten to turn it on. I've forgotten to rearrange it, but I don't think I've ever forgotten to turn it on. That's true. That's true. You know, Alan, there is uh, some weeks where the world events bleed into the tech sector in a big way. And there's also, for this show, an area that we cover very, very heavily. That's encryption. So mm-hmm. guess what? Uh, that is where our two worlds intersect. That's where we start today. we got a big show with a lot of things to cover. Also, a great big feedback segment and a roundabout. Why don't we start with sort of the boogeyman that's been made out of encryption this week and why the logic doesn't really hold up. Alan, where do you want to start with this particular story? Uh, I guess kind of just at the top. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like we say here, less than two months ago, Tech Dirt noted and, you know, that uh, having lost the immediate battle for the U.S. legislation to backdoor all encryption, uh, those in the intelligence community knew they just had to, you know, buy their time and wait until the next big terrorist attack, and then there would be enough, you know, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt to be able to push through some ridiculous law. Uh, and so, you know, immediately, I. Uh, a quote from Robert Litt, who's the top lawyer for the Office of the Director of the of National Intelligence. Mm-hmm. He says, the legislation, uh, legislative environment is very hostile today. The intelligence community, <laughs> yeah, um, it could turn uh, in the event of a terrorist attack or criminal event where strong encryption can be shown to have hindered law enforcement. So right? in other so words, saying, right now people want their encryption. Uh, they, they want their encryption. But if we wait until such time that we can blame encryption yeah. for something happening, then maybe we can convince them that we should be able to backdoor the encryption. It could turn that in the event of a terrorist attack or criminal event where strong encryption could be shown to have hindered law enforcement, that's how they could get the that's, dialogue to turn. They yeah, that's when they get people to not be hostile to a law. So to along come these attacks lock. in Paris, and you <laughs> see it ramped up. You see the encryption being blamed. Uh, like even immediately before there was any information, right? At all, yeah. Like, oh, they must have been using encryption. Oh, they they, they talked on like PlayStation Four live right. voice chat because right. that's not logged. I I crap, I crap my like, pants a few times when I heard my favorite messenger name drop Telegram. I'm like, no, do not break Telegram, please. Don't blame Telegram. But they were in Europe, so the like much higher chance of using WhatsApp than Telegram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and and you know. The, but yes, and the, the whole places four thing is like yes. Well, you know, Xbox Live voice chat isn't really set up to be wiretapped either. Well, or is that the implication that Microsoft cooperates? They kept saying, "Well, the PlayStation Network is very hard to monitor." Never mentioning Microsoft. So I thought the implication was Microsoft's all in with law enforcement on that, and I bet it is what exactly the case is. Well, imagine the amount of false positives you would get monitoring. Uh, I know, right? Xbox Live or PlayStation voice chat. Well, for things like that. This the number of 12-year-olds that yell obscenities into that. This isn't unheard of, though, Alan. I don't know if you remember, but if you go back to uh, Benghazi, uh, the, uh, there was some reports that there was people in EVE Online that were I- in like the compound that was being attacked, and they were talking about the attack as it was going down in the EVE Online game. So even U.S. assets use online gaming to communicate, so it's not unheard right, of. Right, because it... it, it you know, masks that you're, yeah, and, you know, people talked about doing with Second Life and so on as well, and Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that the games really have any encryption or anything, it's just it blends in with regular traffic, and it isn't the type of thing that they zero in on. Yeah, exactly, it's hard to, you know, it's kind of off the wall, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I thought the PlayStation thing was interesting. I also heard um, a lot of blame for Edward Snowden go down, Um, the CIA (laughs) director... 
The CIA director didn't exactly say, but he said the recent uh, revelations have, uh, you know, basically implied that because of the Snowden leaks, terrorists now know about encryption, and now they know they need to use encryption, so therefore they're using encryption, and they're able to communicate, and that's why they're able to plan. Right, and well, it's like, oh, they know how we used to spy on them, so they don't do that anymore. Right, and, it's I, like, well. and I think the reason, one of the other things you kind of have to keep in mind here is the scope of the attack. I mean, we're talking multiple attackers, and we're talking seven, in, you know, in Paris alone, seven locations, right? So that it requires quite a bit of coordination and planning, which implies quite a bit Not of communication. You tell a bunch of separate people, do this sure, at yeah. you this don't know for sure. time on this day. It does imply there could be a fair amount of communication, but it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't do it in person. Right. But also, yeah, like you could easily organize something like that with one single communication. Yeah. You'd meet up in person, like, you make do the, plan, the thing you set the day. at yeah. this time at this place. Yeah. You know, it's one person can do all the coordinating. They don't actually have to have communication between them. Yeah. If you've ever tried to organize a group of like six people to go out for dinner or to a movie, right? It works much better if you pick one person to just decide all of the things. Yes. We're going to this yes. place yeah. to have this kind of <laughs> food. We're going to watch this movie at this time, <laughs> yeah. and they just tell everybody, "Be here at this place at this time." It works a lot better. Um, Otherwise, you end up with just a mass amount of communication and nobody. I, if you if you don't mind, I mean, you are absolutely free to video it. But I have a I have like a forty five second clip that kind of plays a couple of different people condemning encryption, and then the CBS News saying that it is the tech industry that's preventing law enforcement. Do you are you, do you want to hear it? Are you, sure. sure. Okay. Well, just hand it. sort of just to sort of set the tone, so people who are maybe listening to this later understand how this sort of was ramping up and the, it was building steam. And I think it, that's kind of interesting. Almost four days after Paris came under siege. CIA Director John Brennan says terrorists have found new ways to plan major attacks undetected. In the past several years, because of a number of unauthorized disclosures, there have been some policy and legal and other actions that are taken that make our ability collectively, internationally, to find these terrorists much more challenging. Without naming names, Brennan appeared to blame Edward Snowden, a former NSA contractor who exposed top secret details about the agency's phone and internet surveillance program. As a result of his disclosures, the communications companies are less cooperative with the U.S. intelligence service and law enforcement. And in fact, they're taking direct steps to challenge law enforcement and intelligence community surveillance activities. But now Brennan and others suggest potential terrorists are using encrypted messaging apps to avoid detection. I think that Silicon Valley has to take a look at their products um, because if you create a product that allows evil monsters to communicate in this way, that's a big problem. This shows the absolute need to have top surveillance to stop criticizing the, N the NSA. Glenn Greenwald, who first pop So you can kind of get the idea right there. Well, specifically, oh, you need to stop criticizing the Do you NSA. like that? Do you like that? You yes. never, ever, ever... You know, if, if someone says you need to stop criticizing something, that just means you definitely need right. to not and stop criticizing that. Listen to the spin you know, at the maybe, end here. Maybe if you want to decide to allow the NSA to do things, okay, but you never stop criticizing them. I take this, listen to this, this to me takes it as putting pressure on the tech companies to say they're the ones preventing us from staying safe. They weren't able to connect the dots. The technology industry has been a roadblock on this issue for law enforcement, but the government keeps pressing the industry to share data when national security is at risk. But so far, Gail, privacy concerns have won out. <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, that's kind of what's supposed to happen. Isn't that something? <laughs> So that kind of gives you an idea of the tone this week after the attacks and mm -hmm. uh, how how heavy-handed the the encryption is bad and, and the tech all of industries this is are this happening before we actually know anything for right. sure about anything. Right. Yeah. So now for going forward a couple more days, all of a sudden we find out it now appears that the attackers were communicating with regular normal unencrypted SMS messages with the regular phone company that the intelligence agencies have all the ability to track that they want. Yep. Yep. They've already got it. Mm -hmm. Specifically, in Paris, they had new types of surveillance since the Charlie Hebdo attacks in January. Mm -hmm. New enhanced surveillance abilities. Yes. The problem is if you collect every text message, it's very hard to determine which ones are bad. And also, without the context. It's like, we don't know what they said in the text messages, but the text message could just be, you know, 
let's have dinner at seven o'clock,、mm-hmm. and that means that meet at the stadium at seven o'clock. Right. right? This is all it takes. And so the text messages might not have contained anything, but you know the the bigger one here is that、uh, Ryan Gallagher,、uh, who works at the Intercept, noted that、uh, some of the attackers were actually known to law enforcement and the intelligence community as possible problems before the attack,、uh, but were still able to carry out their attacks because you know law enforcement can't watch everybody all the time, kind of thing. And、uh, so he went back and researched the ten most recent high-profile terrorist attacks. And found out that in all in ten out of ten cases of high-profile jihad attacks carried out in Western countries between 2013 and 2015,、mm-hmm. the、uh, some or all of the perpetrators were already known to the authorities before they executed the plot. Wow! Right. So I don't. It's it's like well, they were using some things, so we couldn't keep. We didn't know what they were doing. It's like well, you already knew who they were, and we're watching them. So. It seems like you already had some information. You were able to get something, and so,、hmm. you know, at that case, you can have you know specific warrants and stuff, and not have to just have oh, we need access to everything sent everywhere ever. So they already had them on their radar. They were using unencrypted communications. You know what it begins to sound like to me, Alan, is a fundamental failure of the intelligence community. So they got to blame it on encryption.、Well, encryption is the scapegoat. Sure. Oh, or this is just an opportunity to get more access that they want. That or- too. I mean, it's definitely leveraging that, but too. But if you imagine, they couldn't have. Not, they could not have had a better set of circumstances. Somebody that was already on their monitor list. Somebody、mm-hmm. who was coordinating over unencrypted communications, and and a group of them. And that was Alan, obviously didn't seem that sophisticated. And on top of that, he also bragged in one of their own propaganda magazines about the bomb. Himself, and、yeah. he, or maybe not about. I believe he he bragged about being able to move between borders in the magazine.、Mm. Uh, But like, really, the thing in the end is that gathering all this information, like recording every text message. There's two basic two ways you can use the information, right? There's there's proactive to figure out when somebody's going to do something and stop them before they do it, which is actually pretty difficult because without all the context and so on, it's just never going to work, right?、Um, and then there's reactive. Once we know who the people are, we can go back and then figure out all the you know who they were communicating with, and and maybe find the whole chain of people, and that maybe has some value, but you know the ability to actually predict when people are going to do stuff is not actually that easy. I agree.、Right? I agree. Uh, and it, it shows you that the people that are coming on, these experts that are coming on, and, and to the media are are no such thing. <laughs> they are no expert at all. They go on there and they are pushing an agenda. And what when events like this happen, what you can do is you can identify the people that are anti privacy, and you can just keep little tabs on them and see when they come back up around and see what they have to say.、Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I、uh, I think it's interesting. The Intercept did that work, and、uh, you know there is、uh, here's we have a link to a couple other reports in the show notes, like this one here. Our Our ISIS geeks using phone apps. Back to the attacks in Paris. One thing investigators are trying to figure out: How did these terrorists go undetected as they planned the attacks? So this was,、uh, you know, a, a couple of days before it was revealed that they were、uh, using SMS. And so they're in this report. They talk about the PlayStation. They talk about geek apps on phones and things like that.、Uh, so we have、uh, some of those stories linked in the show notes as well for extra reading if you guys are curious about it. Alan, any other thoughts on this story? Uh, not really. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of yes. Uh, uh, Schneider's blog title is the best one though. It's like Paris terrorists use double ROT thirteen encryption. Oh yes, yeah. Which if you rotate by thirteen twice, you end up all the way back. So A is A and B is B. Yeah.、Uh, he also, you know, he brilliantly adds at the end just one sentence. He doesn't have much commentary. He's quoting mostly in this blog post.、Mm-hmm. One sentence at the end though. And what is this about ma- the mastermind label? Why do we have to make them smarter than they are? I mean, they're not. You know, like you were saying, these guys were not masterminds, but yet we call them the masterminds of the Paris attacks. They're using SMS. You know, they're not coordinated very well. All these things.、Um, yeah. So yeah, Schneier has been calling it out the entire time, which I really appreciated to have somebody. I'm hoping that with prominent voices in this as a rebuttal. This doesn't get a lot of traction.、Um, the CIA、uh, l- l- top lawyer that Alan quoted earlier was hoping that something like this would actually move the conversation all the way into the legislation. I hope that is not the case, and I hope the、mm-hmm. fact that these terrorists weren't using fancy encryption slows that momentum down a little bit. 
We will see. All right, Alan. Can I tell you about something else you should have some momentum around? Sure. Your mobile service provider. That'd be Ting. Go over to, ready for this one? TechSnap.Ting.com. TechSnap.Ting.com. Oh, my goodness. I know a little secret. A little birdie told me a little secret that I want to share with you. It's actually a big secret. So here in the U.S. of A., we got this thing called, well, I guess you guys, you guys copy us everywhere now. But we got this thing called Black Friday. And it's nuts. It's crazy. It's all the sales you'd ever want. And, uh, you know, Ting was uh, honey badger about it. They're like, oh, we're not going to do any sales. Yeah, I know we got mobile that makes sense. You know, our entire existence, we are a sale. You know, you pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 a line. It's just your usage on top of that. No contract. We don't need to have a Black Friday sale. So I called up Kyra. I said, Kyra, Chris here. She said, hey, Chris, how's it going? I said, Kyra, I want to personally talk to you about this Black Friday shenanigans. Uh, rumor, rumor has it on the Twitterverse that uh, Ting isn't doing a Black Friday sale. Kyra, can you, can you do something about this? And she says, Chris, I, I, you can't tell anybody this. And I said, okay, Kyra, what is it? She says, we're having a huge sale. We're going to have our biggest sale yet with the popular, like our biggest devices, our most popular devices. She sounds like, yeah, I know about those. Yeah. 30% off. Plus bonus credits, free shipping, discounted SIM cards. It's going to go crazy. Crazy. 30% off bonus credit, free shipping, discounted SIM cards. Big discounts on the most popular devices. Black Friday sales coming if you've been thinking about switching to Ting. I've been using Ting for a couple of years now. See how much you would save by only paying for what you actually use. You want to use it as a MiFi tethering device? Just pay for it when you use it. Not going to use it for a couple of days? Ain't no thing. Put it in a drawer? I don't care. Use it when you're real busy. It all works itself out. It's lovely. Plus, you can get really cheap SIMs and then put them in your devices ready to go, and then the service is super economical. But what I really love about Ting... They have an outrageously, outrageously good dashboard that lets you do things like manage your device, check your usage. The control panel also lets you label each device so I can say this one's Jenny's device. She uses the phone all the time because she just had a baby, right? This one's Rikai's device. He just only uses data. What's this red to? Uh, anyways, and then here's my device. You can see I'm using Wi-Fi all the time. So you can label each device like that. You get their break, their usage broken out for you. You can pause a device if you want to turn it off for a little while, like maybe a MiFi device or something like this. You can go in there and like say, don't show my caller ID, turn off tethering, or just turn off picture messaging if you want. You can also set alert thresholds if you're trying to stay within a budget, which is super cool. This dashboard works across multiple devices. They also pair it with a smart app for your iPhone or your Android device. So you can go check it out at techsnap.ting.com. And then remember, on Black Friday, their biggest, biggest sale yet. Huge sale. Huge sale, 30% off their most popular devices. Now remember, you can't tell anybody, okay? Well, actually, you're my close personal friend. You can tell your other close friends. But it was a secret that Kyra told me. So let's keep the secret in the TechSnap family and our immediate family, their immediate family, and their associates, and then their cousins. TechSnap.ting.com, huge Black Friday sale coming up. Go get $25 off your first device or $25 in service credit by going to TechSnap.ting.com. Support this show. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring. The TechSnap program. You know, I'm thinking about, Alan, just thinking I have a cracked phone right now. It is, like, super crazy busticated, and I'm thinking about mm -hmm. getting a Nexus 5X. Thinking about it. The reviews are in, and they're, it's passing. It's passing for me. I think I'm, I might do it. So, uh, Alan, I am sitting right here on a cable connection. So when I see a story about a backdoor built into a cable modem, I think, oh, well, at least my backdoors don't have backdoors. What's going <laughs> on, Alan? Yeah, so this one is... Uh so, uh, a security researcher, uh, Bernardo Rodriguez, uh, was invited to give a talk at a security conference, and while trying to decide what topic to do, uh, he decided to research cable modem security. Unlike the talks at security conferences years ago, where you know talking about cable modem security was about how to you know get free cable, mm -hmm. uh, you know connect your you know change your cable modem MAC address and get free internet access, or you know use two different things and get double the internet speed and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this was instead about the security of the cable modems, the technology used to manage the cable modems, how the data is protected, and how ISPs upgrade the firmware on your modem. Uh, spoiler alert, everything is really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shocker. So, you know, we talk about how bad people are at like updating the firmware on the router and stuff. Well, most times your router is now bundled into the modem. And the firmware is pushed onto you by your ISP and right. you have no control over it. Right. Of course. Why would you? Yeah. Um, so uh, he said, well, researching on the subject, I found a previously undisclosed backdoor in the RS cable modems, uh, affecting many of the devices, including the TG862, TG862G, uh, and the DG860A. 
Uh, as of this writing, Shodan sh uh, searches indicate that the backdoor affects over 600,000 externally accessible hosts, and the vendor did not state whether they're actually going to fix it or not. Hmm. Uh, worse, RS doesn't actually let you download the firmware on their website hmm. because they don't want security researchers to reverse engineer it. Uh, so you can only download the firmware if you're one of the cable companies that's bought a bunch from them. Uh, yeah, so the RS Soho grade cable modems contain an undocumented library called librs underscore password that acts as a backdoor allowing uh, privileged logins using a custom password. Uh. Uh, so this is actually something that's been known since about 2009, but basically the RS devices have a password of the day. What? So uh, they use a DS encryption thing with a specific seed, and then um, it uh, adds the date. So each day, the password that you use to remotely manage the, phone, the uh, modem changes so that if it got leaked out, it would only work for a day kind of thing, right? In this way, the technicians at the ISPs can just take the seed and the date, plug it in, and get the password to uh, manage your modem okay, for you. Okay. Uh, the problem is that it, they ship with the default one, and the ISPs rarely ever change it. Surprise. Uh, and so the default uh, MPSJKMDHAI is what almost everybody uses. <laughs> and so, you know, you just plug that into the formula, and now you know the password for all the modems. And you get this administrative interface. Uh, so then that backdoor account can be used to enable Telnet or SSH and then remotely uh, log in. So basically, there's a hidden... Uh, HTTP administrative interface. So if you just go to a specific address, you know, tech support CGI or whatever, and uh, or access it via custom SNMP MIBs that you just have to know are there, and you get in. Uh, once you enable SSH by just uh, poking that MIB or doing this blind HTTP post to a secret URL, uh, you can SSH in, and uh, the user is root, and the password is RS. Perfect. Uh, when you access the Telnet session or authenticate over SSH, the system spawns the mini CLI shell uh, and then asks for the backdoor password. Uh, and then you enter that and you're good to go. So, and then there's a, yes, they put a backdoor in the backdoor. Joel from D-Link would be envious. <laughs> if you remember that story yes. a while ago. <laughs> um, so the undocumented backdoor uh, password, they've, so even if they fix that, it turns out that that back door has a second back door if you inspect the code. Uh, instead of needing this password of the day password, uh, there's also a password based on the last five digits of the modem serial number. So this is specific to each different modem, whereas the password of the day is specific to every modem of the model. Okay. Um, so then if you type in the serial number of the modem, you get a full busy box shell with no restrictions. So nice. the, That's if, a surprise. If, you have, if you have the password of the day password, you get a very restricted shell that only has certain commands. Okay. But because of the way the code's written, where it's just substituting the things you run into commands. So like when you tell it to do a TFTP and give it the the like IP address and the path, those are just S printf into the command. So if you were to say do the command with one of the parameters being, say, a semicolon. And then the second parameter being some other command, it would run a TFTP that wouldn't work, and then the other command. Yeah. That's like uh, the mother so, load. <laughs> so, yeah. So, their main backdoor has an injection vulnerability in it. And it turns out there's also another backdoor using a <laughs> yeah. different secret password. Uh, at least this one's unique per device, but I'm sure there's some way to get the model number or the uh, serial number of the device without needing to be root on the device, and then that would give you root on the device. Uh, and then that one gives you the full busy box shell. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> if you look at the code, it's like, oh, there's like four different ways to get into this device. So, uh, why? Uh, it's hard to say. So that when the user changes the password, the ISP can still get in, I suppose, but the password of the day thing kind of works if the ISP changes the seed. Instead of using the default one? Yeah, okay. But the model number one, I don't know. That's pretty lame. Um, so yeah, that's pretty bad. Uh, so then the researcher goes on to uh, figure out how to market the vulnerability. You know, it needs like a name and a marketing of course. scheme. Of right? Of course. Uh, so he decided the best way to do that uh, was a good old-fashioned key gen. 
remember key gens? Yeah. And everything. You know, you get a little thing. And With the cool so music sometimes if yeah. you're lucky. So he's got the like the faux ASCII art <laughs> and the cool music. I love it. So if you scroll down a little bit, there's there's a video with sound. Oh, perfect. Of course there is. <laughs> so you just type in your model or your serial number and it gives you the password okay, to I'm ready. root the device. Okay, I'm ready. This is, it looks like he's... Yes. Exactly how I remember it, Alan. He even provides a YouTube link to the source where he, he got the chiptune from. It's called... Uh, something about the toilet. I forget what it's called now. Something about the toilet. Uh, if you look up in the show notes just a little bit there, you'll see the, uh, or not the show notes, the website just above the video when you're done. A little higher? Toilet Story 5. Yeah, Toilet Story 5. Oh, I like Toy Story. That's good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he notified CERT about it uh, on September 13th. And yeah. CERT has a 45-day disclosure policy. And so he's now uh, disclosed it now that it's been uh, 45 days. Uh, well, it's actually been... Uh, two months now, uh, and uh, the vendor still has not corrected the issue, and it's not really being communicated. Womp womp. So he said his experience dealing with CERT was quite good, uh, but the vendor not so good. And then he uh, also provides a link, uh, which we all found quite funny. Uh, a technician at a cable company uh, provided some more information, and turns out there's another backdoor. In the device, completely unrelated to these ones. So I, I have lost. Are we on three now? Uh, something like that. Okay. Yeah. They're okay. just vulnerabilities in the vulnerabilities in the vulnerabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when you actually log into the device, you get this cookie. Uh, if you see the, the link, is the console cowboy blog link? I don't see it. Oh, just is it on the other the thing? Oh, I sorry. Sorry, I thought it was in his blog. Okay, go ahead. I'll find it. Uh, so it's right below the tweet in the blog that you were looking at there. Oh, it is there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just below the picture of the fake tweet. Yeah, anyway, uh, so when face. you log into the oh, device, it basically it sets this cookie called mm -hmm. credential equals, and then it's a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> Turns out that gibberish is just base64 encoding of some JSON. Uh, and then when you look at that, it's just, you know, valid is true, technician false, credential equals base64 encoding of username colon password, you know, like HTTP basic auth from the 80s. Uh, and primary only false access all equals true name admin and so on. So first thing he did is try setting technician just to true, but that didn't quite work. Yeah. Uh, and he played with it a bit more. Turns out if you just set the uh, credentials to technician colon, so <laughs> the username technician and no password, mm -hmm. it works. You can't actually log into the web interface with that, but if you send commands to it with that, it will just work. So either it just doesn't <laughs> check the password or yep. the web interface yeah, is smart enough to check for a null password, but the other start isn't. Yep. That's what I was thinking. Uh, but then he can use that to just go and set random MIBs. Uh, so he could actually set the admin, the technician password uh, and or other passwords and get access to it. And so he can just change any setting. You know, He can set the password to CRAD password, or he could change the DNS server uh, so that, you know, you would use a, a, a DNS server that would turn false results and give you man-in-the-middle attacks hmm. and so on. Hmm. Uh, and then the other one here is, uh, oh, it's also susceptible to cross-site request forgery. So if you happen to have recently logged into your router and then go to a malicious website, that website could cause your browser to go to the router page and change stuff. Uh, because you're already logged in. Right. This is just every week, Alan. Every week is just something like that. But he that. said the worst part is even if end users know about the uh, bug and even if there were a fix, the end users can't update their device because it's controlled by the ISP. Right. I I can't help but be <coughs> suspicious, too. That's a very... It's a lot of back doors. Yeah. And this is just... Uh, this is just you got to figure the tip of the iceberg potentially. Could be a lot mm -hmm. of lot of things, a lot of different oh, yeah. models Tons out there, a lot of different makers. Like this. Yes. Uh, they all, the blog, the original post also talks about a new website, uh, firmware. Dot something, firmware. Dot re. What's this? Uh, which searches firmware for known things like known passwords. So it'll you upload a firmware image for it, and it will just scan through it and look for things like you know. The word admin or that is a simple the website. Look at that admin. thing. <laughs> it's just basic. Well, yeah, you, well, if you click the first thing at the top there, the uh, keys and passwords, uh -huh. you can see it has like the MD5 ah. hashes of the word admin a bunch of times in yeah. different uh, or you know triple des and a bunch of different ones, and so it scans all the firmwares you upload to see if 
that basic stuff is in there. Hmm. And if it is, then it's like, well, that's an obvious problem. Or uh, also have uh, known vulnerabilities like uh, authorized keys entries built into QNAP products or right. uh, you know, hard-coded FTP and shell user accounts built into the Xerox Color Cube and Work Center devices. Yeah. This is actually pretty nice, huh? So you can mm-hmm. you can take that and just upload it there, and that's firmware.re. Yeah. So this, yeah, this just started as a paper at Black Hat, but it's turning into a web service where people will be able to upload firmware and uh, check it for known vulnerabilities and so on. That's cool. Or common mistakes, there, or common things that are be in firmwares that result in horrible compromises. You know, we think about so many, we think about security in so many different ways, but we really, at the end of the day, are still we still have these devices that the ISPs have control over at just this fundamental level. That is, is, yeah, it's gotten worse. We used to not have the ISPs have control of their, the router, only the right, motor. Right? right, right. What do you think, Alan? Um, uh, is, there, is there much, much takeaway from this other than if you can, use your own equipment? Is that pretty much the takeaway? <laughs> I think it is, right? That's what it boils down to is if you can, use your own equipment if you really care about security. Uh, which is kind of an old go-to. All right, well, let me tell you about something else that's a go-to. That's DigitalOcean. That's my go-to for Linux infrastructure on demand. Use our promo code SNAPOcean, and you'll get a $10 credit. And I really encourage you to try it, because for $10, you can try it through a $5 rig two months for free. It is a really awesome service because it's all SSDs built on top of super fast hypervisors with really great connections. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server. Now check this out. I don't know how long it takes you to order something like like from like, you know, the fast food restaurant or when you're ordering yourself some Thai food delivery, but 55 seconds is pretty dang fast for getting a server spun up and for less than or for $5 a month. And for $10 for two months, when you use our promo code SNAPOcean, which gives you the $10 credit, you can get a rig for free. 512 megabytes of RAM, 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. That's just $5 a month, and our SNAPOcean promo gives you the $10. DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Germany, and a great new brand one, brand spanking new one in Toronto, real spanking. And the interface has a simple intuitive control panel. This is the part I really love. It's very straightforward. Very simple, yet extremely powerful. They didn't limit it, and they have a really nice API. And there's a lot of really good apps already built around their API. So you can go take advantage of those, of those now or write your own. They have a bunch of code that's already open. They have lots of tutorials also available. You can go over to their community section and sort of browse through some of these tutorials. Guides for Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, CoreOS, and of course FreeBSD. They have FreeBSD servers as well. Mm-hmm. DigitalOcean is where I go to spin up a system, and now I've got more than ever. I've got one doing BitTorrent Sync and a couple other activities for me. I've got a Quasical server, Quasal Core server that also runs Sync Thing. I got a Minecraft server, and now I have a Fedora 23 server running MB that I'm using as testing Fedora as a server, just to kind of do some long-term research. That's what I love about DigitalOcean is the pricing makes it sensible. If I just want to have a rig to do some long-term research, five dollars a month, I can afford that. But it also is fast enough, reliable enough, and scalable enough that I can also use it as my production system. So we have systems that our production processes actually depend on every single day up on DigitalOcean, and you can too. Get started with SnapOcean, get a $10 credit, support this show, and start for free. There really are so many things you can do with your own server up in the sky, in the cloud, as they say. Up in the cloud. You know, it really is great systems, really great servers, all built on SSD, so it makes a lot of sense. But what I think... If you haven't connected the dots yet, the part you might be missing is how surprisingly easy it is to just one-click deploy an application and try something. And then you really do feel empowered to have all of that under your control. And if you ever get lost or stuck, they have an HTML5 console, so you can get right there, see the console, see what's going on. It works really well. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code SNAPOcean and go get that server up in the sky, or the cloud, as they call it. Okay, Alan. So uh, moving right along, uh, the next story on the TechSnap program. Every now and then, in fact, was it two weeks ago? We were kind of talking about rats, and uh, I was like, mm-hmm. I w- we were kind of laughing about the name. Uh, and now we have a social rat, yes. but probably not the kind of rat people might be thinking of. What are we talking about? Uh, so this is you know, Rote Access Trojan that we talked about before. Uh, basically, malicious malware that runs on your computer, giving unlimited access to a cyber criminal who can steal information or install other malicious programs. Right. Mm-hmm. So they can watch what they can watch your screen. They can move your mouse. They can type things. They can make your computer do whatever they want. You know, wait till you're not using it, and then install uh, a virus on it or keyloggers or whatever they want to do. Uh, you know, it makes you know if you have passwords saved on it, they can log into your accounts and do stuff like change the email address that controls it. Or you know, if your email happens to be open, then. <laughs> They could, you know, do a password reset and forward the emails sure, themselves. Yeah. Whatever they want to do. Sure. 
Uh, so they're able to operate under the radar of traditional security measures because a RAT install mechanism is usually attached to a legitimate program, right? Uh, you know, they, you, the one of the classic ones was like a, a Tetris game. You go to play it, and it would install a RAT in the background, and then you would play the Tetris game, and it would work. You didn't realize that you also installed this Trojan. Yep. Boy, that's, right. yeah. Eventually you get it and then, you know, allow an intruder to do just about anything on the target computer, including access confidential information, such as credit cards, social security numbers, activate systems uh, video or webcam, you know, distribute malware, alter files, do whatever they want to do. Uh, so rats have been used by countries and hacktivists for many years. However, recently uh, we've seen this remote attack, uh, or remote access attack vector uh, migrate to the online bank fraud. Because, you know, banks now don't let people, uh, you know, they, their fraud alarm will be triggered if all of a sudden you're accessing your bank account from a different country oh, yeah. than usual. Right. Or so, sometimes they have, like, some sort of authentication token or something you have to yes, have. Or, you know, if my bank puts a cookie on my computer and if I access it from a different computer, I have to do extra steps yeah. than if I'm accessing on yep. a computer I normally access. My bank, bank does that, actually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so this makes it easier to compromise your bank account if I just use your computer to rob your bank account. Uh, and it's also much harder for you, the victim, to claim it wasn't you when it was done from your computer. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, That's absolutely true. I didn't think yeah. about that. So uh, these specific rats that we're talking about are termed uh, rat in the browser. Uh, and they give cyber criminals access to banking credentials and account information. So basically, when you go to your bank and you type in your username and password, the rat in the browser uh, steals that as you're typing it into the browser. And then can use it they can show up later, like the middle of the night, and then use your computer to log into your bank and start the transfer or whatever. Uh, you know, one of the reasons these Trojans have spread so rapidly is because banks often use traditional risk measures such as device fingerprinting, what we just talked about, uh, to validate the device's reputation, assigning risk right. to new or untrusted devices and assigning trust to known user so devices. So in a way, like they kind of have to do this as a response because they're kind of yeah. running out of options. Yes, the the banks are stopping most of the other ones because the banks are compelled to do so because the banks lose money when they get robbed, right? <laughs> yeah. Oftentimes, if, as long as you report it to the bank within 30 days, they give you your money back. So the bank lost that money. So the bank's really interested in making that not happen. Right. Uh, so right in the browser sessions are, therefore, often successful since these detections won't find anything unusual because it's your computer that you normally use accessing your account. Uh, so the uh, a social rat in the browser adds another layer of complexity as fraudsters are beginning to use social engineering to carry out remote access attacks. You know, as a fraudster needs to do is convince a user to install a standard remote support tool on their computer, right? Like Ultra VNC or Arrow Admin or Remote PC or Team Viewer or whatever, and use it to perpetuate the online bank fraud. This type of bank fraud is simple for cyber criminals to carry out since it doesn't require the technical know-how to develop their own malware or something, right? Mm-hmm. It's the, you know, the typical, they call you up, oh, we're from Microsoft, your yes. computer's sending a virus, and it's all yeah. TeamViewer, and, we'll, and we'll, use your, we'll fix your computer for it's you. It's like the lowest common form, it's the most accessible co- form of frauding somebody because you don't have to like, even know like, like, the, the dark websites you don't have to, to buy the anything, malware. You don't even have to know anything about computers, you could train right. yes. monkeys to do this. Yes, at scale. Ooh, now you're yes. thinking, Alan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so here's how it works, right? A fraudster calls a user and convinces him or her that they're an employee of a reputable organization like the ISP, the bank, Microsoft, whatever. It explains to the user that there's a security issue on their computer and then fools the user into downloading and installing a remote support tool. Uh, or it could be malware, but usually they're just using TeamViewer or VNC or whatever. And that gives uh, the fraudster access uh, to the machine. Uh, the fraudster then convinces the user to log into his or her bank account to, uh, for a quick security check. So it's like, oh, we need to know that you're really you. So why don't you log into your bank account for us? That's crazy. <laughs> I don't know how people fall for this. but yeah. uh, So now the attacker is in and can submit a fraudulent transaction. And this is a relatively easy process for the criminal that requires less technical know-how and monetary expenditure than a regular you know, uh, compromising of the machine. There's yeah. a related story here about uh, something like this uh, draining a California escrow firm out of business <laughs> using uh, a tool like this. Yikes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's pretty crazy the stuff you can do. Yeah. Hmm. 
Hmm. And and I guess it makes sense that these kind of things would be coming up uh, more and more now that there's more uh, sort of preventative steps by the banks. But so what is the, I guess, uh, so here's the issue, Alan, that I, this is where I'd say what's the solution is because what's happening is they're calling and saying, hello, I'm Microsoft or I'm Dell and I, and your computer has alerted us on our monitoring dashboard and I'm here to help you. They're essentially, they're using the trust or the brand that those companies have to get in with the customer. The customer has to be savvy enough to know that Microsoft would never preemptively call them like that. Exactly. But or that, that Microsoft that's an doesn't educational have that thing. kind of dashboard on their computer either. <laughs> that seems to be an educational thing, though, that's not really going to happen because people are, gonna, people are suckers. So that's, that's kind of a bummer. And you can see also how you could use this in a business to get access to a business's network as well yeah. and uh, infiltrate that way. So, yeah, all right. So now... What else, Alan? What else? Any other thoughts on this? Uh, no, that's, that's about it for that one. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we will uh, keep moving right along. And I tell you, I, we have, if I recall, a couple of stories in the roundup that uh, follow up on a couple of stories. Quite a few, yes. Yeah, from this. All right. Well, let me tell you about our friends over at IX Systems. IXSystems.com slash TechSnap are the sponsors of the TechSnap program. Man, are we excited to have IX on, too, because they are really, once Alan and I both found them, we thought, this is really how it should have been all along. And, you know, IX Systems was around long enough that the, the, it was kind of my bad. Uh, they've, they're not brand new to the scene. I just didn't know no, about they've them. they've been around yeah. uh, so long it's not funny, actually. Yes, yeah, you know, they survived the dot-com boom. They really decided they, they decided and figured out how to make a sustainable company. It just was really my bad for not finding them sooner. I had to go through the trenches. I had to order the hardware from all of the vendors that you know about and discover, oh, this one has this controller card that is the bad generation that wipes the drives. Oh, this, this model had all of the tape drive failures. This model has... I could go on and on, actually. Mm -hmm. I've tried them all. None of them were the customer service experience of iX Systems. It starts because iX Systems truly understands the hardware, and they have deep relationships with the best vendors in the business. So that's a, they really got it covered on the hardware side. They really use good stuff. But on the people side, that's the differentiator. On the people side, they actually hire folks that work with these open source projects that are powering your infrastructure, that are pushing things forward. So they got these hardware relationships, they have the software relationship, and then they brought it together with incredible customer service. And they really stick to their products, and they really reach out to the community and integrate at that point foundational level as well. It's that mixture that makes them an irreplaceable business partner. Go to ixsystems.com slash techsnap and see the white glove service I'm talking about. You know, look at Mr. Alan Jude over there. He's rocking that IX systems all over the scale engine infrastructure because he knows what's up. He knows what's up. We got one major serious storage rig here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Studios. It's an IX systems rig. We know mm -hmm. what's up. That's how we roll. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Go there to get the white paper to learn more and most importantly, Support this show. Keep shows like yep. ours going by visiting ixsystems.com slash techsnap and learn more. Anything also, specifically? remember to submit your war stories to uh, yeah. ixsystems.com slash mission complete. That, that's right. Tell the them how complete. you used uh, you know, FreeNAS or ZFS or BSD or whatever, your IX hardware to uh, save the day at some point or get some job done. Yeah, get in on that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, check yeah, them out. It doesn't actually have to be even a war story. It's just when you used ZFS or FreeBSD or open source or whatever to get some job done. And they have some October Mission Complete Best Stories up on their blog. You can go read mm -hmm. those right now as well. And there's prizes. iXsystems.com slash TechSnap. Big thank you to iXsystems for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Really appreciate it. Okay, Alan. Now, uh, a little Rick birdie told me that there is a new episode of the BSD Now Show out. Episode 116. Congratulations, Alan, you did yes. it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ah, so this is a good interview we did with George Wilson, who works on ZFS mm. at Delphix. Uh, he talks about uh, stuff that's coming out soon, like compressed ARC. Uh, so this is keeping the cached copies of the files that are in RAM. If they're compressed nice. on disk, when we read them from the disk into RAM... If we keep them compressed, we can fit more in RAM. Mm -hmm. So this works differently than the RAM compression stuff you have in Linux, which is when RAM gets full, let's compress some stuff in order to make a bit more room. This is more, it, since it's already compressed on disk, just keep it compressed. So it's not actually having to use any CPU to actually do extra compression. Love it. Or compression that was already done. Then it just decompresses it when you access it. And since LZ4's decompression is so fast, you get like multiple gigabytes per second per core. Uh, you know, you can saturate your 10 gigabit NIC with a, even just a four or eight core server. Hmm. Uh, and they've got some spectacular results with it. Uh, on databases and stuff that are full of text, they get compression ratios of, you know, two, three, four X. I would imagine. So they have a machine that has 768 gigs of RAM. 
and they were using all of that for Ark at one point. And they were like, well, we can't really put any more RAM in this machine. It's actually at the limit of what the processor will sure, support. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, we'd have to buy a new machine with like four processors to fit more RAM in this. They put the compressed Arc thing on it. It's now using 446 gigs of its RAM. And in that 446 gigs of RAM, they're keeping 1.3 terabytes of compressed data. Whoa. So their entire database workload is now sitting in RAM, and there's RAM to spare. There's your big data solution right there, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty cool episode. Go check that yeah. out. Uh, he also talks about what's coming up, including he's working on a way to dynamically deal with uh, 512 versus 4K sector drives, where you know if you set it up wrong, where you wouldn't have to actually destroy your pool and start mm. over, you would just say, hey, from now on, allocate as 4K instead of 512. And going forward, uh, it takes care of it. Yeah. So, you know, currently I, I actually have one where I accidentally didn't set the thing before I added a set of drives. So I have a pool that has a bunch of drives that are 4K and are set to 4K. And then one last set of drives that are 4K but are set to 512. <laughs> so when you write to them, they're really slow. Uh, reading is fine, but writing is slow. If you had this patch that he's working on that's not out yet, uh, it would just do all future writes as 4K. And so the performance would come back on those drives, and I wouldn't have to retouch any of the data that's already sitting there. Lovely. So it could still read them in 512s. That's fine. It would just, the writing would all happen as 4Ks, and it would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, also, kind of a special plug for next week's live episode of BSD Now, something kind of fun yes. going on. Uh, Brian Cantrill is coming back to do another rant. <laughs> uh, it was our most popular episode ever. If you haven't seen it, uh, I think it's one of something. It's a Ubuntu Kills Kittens is the episode title. Right. Uh, but Brian is a very high energy speaker. If you've never seen him speak before, it's uh, a special experience. Uh, but you should definitely tune in live. That'll be Wednesday. Although, special note, we'll be recording the regular part of the show on Tuesday because uh, Chris Moore's got the uh, early Thanksgiving family coming into town. Mm -hmm. so he wants I know to how that free. goes. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the live Recording of the show will actually happen on Tuesday, but the interview will still be live uh, recorded on Wednesday because that's when we have Brian scheduled to do it. Uh, but so definitely tune in on Wednesday at the regular time uh, to catch Brian Cantrill uh, ranting and raving, and it'll be awesome. So uh, for the regular time, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get the BSD Now time in your mm -hmm. local time and go to jblive.tv to watch that with the chat room as well. All right, so Alan, we've got some great emails and some roundups. So with the news all done, it's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or starting a thread in our subreddit at techsnap.reddit.com. Ike writes in, and look at this, Alan. He was savvy. He says, I know it's another double-double tech snap scheduled, and I thought, well, I'd send this in. What is the purpose? I know. I like it when they're savvy. I, what is the purpose of the loopback interface, and what can a clever sysadmin do with it? I have a vague recollection of someone telling me that a loopback was there for a machine to talk to itself, but... But why? I guess it's just something that's always there. I never touch it, and I don't think about it. But I should be doing, should I be doing something with it? Are there any security concerns or advantage to the loopback? Keep up the great show. Thanks, Ike. Right. So uh, there's a couple things. Uh, so the loopback adapter has your loopback IP address, right? 127.0.0.1, or in uh, IPv6, colon, colon, 1. <clears throat> and this is how you, for example, if you run a web server on your computer, uh, but don't want it to be exposed to the internet, but still want to access it from your web browser, you can go to 127.0.0.1 in your web browser and it'll pull up the website from your local machine. <clears throat> the other thing it's used for, actually, is that, you know, LO0 or what do they call it on Linux? Just LO? I don't know. Anyway, um, that loopback adapter is actually used in the routing table. When you go to, when you like ping your own IP address, that doesn't go out over the internet and then get turned around by a router and sent back to you. Uh, your computer is like, oh, the route to get to here is uh, over the loopback interface. <laughs> and it just sends it there and it comes, you know, uh, it goes out and then it comes in and then the computer's like, oh, ping, responds and back. You know, uh, so yeah, your loopback interface is so that you can connect to yourself, basically. 
Uh, I've also been, you know, I'll, sometimes it's just a quick validation. Is my networking working at all right now? I can't ping anything on this network. Is networking even functional? Can I ping 127.0.0.1 and get a reply? Right. So, yeah, basically, that's, you check that. And then you, can I ping my own IP address? Can I ping uh, the router, which is supposed to be, you know, one hop away from me in the same broadcast domain? And, it's, and then can I ping beyond that and on that? From a server talk. standpoint, it's really nice from a security aspect because a lot of the things you'll install that have like a web administration or like SQL mm-hmm. or anything that does like remote listening, a lot of times by default, they'll listen on the loopback interface so you can communicate Only. with them. Yeah. Right. Thank so you. that you can access it from that machine, but you can't access it from the network. So yep. it's very handy for that. Yep. Also, on FreeBSD, when you're doing jail, since you can make a jail only have access to one IP address, yeah. you can add extra IP addresses hmm. to the loopback interface, like 127.0.0.2, and give that to the jail. And now the jail only has access on the same computer. All right, Alan, brace yourselves, because this one comes from John from Canada. He says, hi, Alan and Chris. I wrote to you guys a couple of weeks ago about my FreeNAS build, and I had another question I was hoping you could shed some light on. From what I understand, the reason that ZFS hasn't been brought into the Linux kernel is that the CDL, the CDDL license is incompatible with the GPL, and thus they cannot be compiled together into a single binary, like most file systems are on Linux. If we want... To, if, we want to Z, if we want ZFS, we need to run it as a kernel module and therefore it hasn't seen widespread adoption. My question is, why is this a problem for Linux but not for BSD? Is the BSD license somehow more compatible with CDDL? Shouldn't the same problem arise in BSD or is BSD structured in a different way that it's not a matter of the license at all? Also, are you familiar with how much of a problem it is not having ZFS in the kernel? Should it make a difference in the long run as to how stable ZFS is and has the ability to be run on Linux? Does Linux ever have hope of having top-notch ZFS support? Hope, uh, hope to keep enjoying the shows for a long time. John from Canada. A few questions in there for you, Alan. Right. So uh, the first one was CDDL and GPL compatibility. Originally, people thought, no, that was just not, never going to work. Uh, and at some point, uh, the ZFS on Linux people said, actually, we think it's fine. And then the Debian people, who are very strict about licensing stuff, decided that it was actually fine. Uh, Or probably more likely decided they really, really want ZFS. (laughs) Um, And so uh, Debian and Ubuntu will be getting ZFS uh, in a more mainstream-y way. So currently what you have to do is get the ZFS ZFS on Linux source code from zfsonlinux.org and compile it on your own system. Uh, and then it's okay because you're not distributing a binary of it already set up, mushed together or whatever. Uh, And the problem with that is when you update your kernel, all of a sudden that ZFS module you have is not the same version and it won't work and you won't be able to access your files until you recompile ZFS. And uh, if you're booting off ZFS, that's a big deal. So you probably don't want to boot off ZFS on Linux. Um, So then, uh, so what Ubuntu is going to do with their next release is have, what is it called? D- DKMS. DKMS, which basically means when you install a kernel update, it will automatically compile the newer ZFS for you and install it as part of the update. Uh, then in the version of uh, you want to, after that, they'll actually be having uh, the full thing and having uh, ZFS as a module that you want and, to and we for believe you, this whatever. is possible because of maybe some some uh, stuff that the Debian lawyers have been looking at something to this degree well, right I don't know it kind of boils down to I don't think anybody's 100% sure and they've just decided it's worth the risk now I don't know yeah maybe um, to be competitive yeah uh, and you know also uh, it's interesting they're taking this approach this has been the approach to say use ZFS in Arch for, for almost ever now is just use DKMS. Uh, it's also like a lot of times the way rolling distributions handle things like VirtualBox uh, kernel modules and things like that. Just, you know, have DKMS rebuild them. And on a fast, you know, multi core system, it takes 20 seconds to build the module. So it's not really well, a big ZFS deal. Well, ZFS will take slightly longer than that. <laughs> I would imagine. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Uh, but, you know, like what Alan is what Alan is basically saying, though, is that there's just that tiny, tiny slice of reliability in that there's there could be that delta between when you've updated your kernel and reboot and when that module gets built, if it's something doesn't build right or something like that, and you can't access your file system once you're running that new kernel. Uh, and so that's why a lot of people, right. what they'll so, do on Linux is they'll do a dedicated ZFS data set, and then their boot volumes are, you know, things like Extended 4 or XFS or ButterFS, something right. like that. So in, in general, you basically, uh, 
Yeah. So if uh, Debian is basically solving this problem with either DKMS or actually bundling it properly. Uh, but yeah, it's a slight issue if you are just using the older way of doing it where you compile it by hand and add the thing. Uh, but So your second part of the question you had was why doesn't BSD have this problem? Well, uh, I, I suggest you go over to chooseadlicense.com and read the GPL3. Uh, and you'll see that is many, 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 many pages, uh, including uh, there's some uh, specific language in here about combining things. Well, and the so, Linux kernel's under GPL2. Right, yes. So there's also the GPL2 on yeah, the page, yeah. uh, which is slightly fewer pages long, but uh, there are specific things about uh, combining copies. Uh, or combining different bits of software when they might have different licenses and so on. And that clause is the one that causes the problem, right? Uh, um, I don't remember the exact where in the license it is. But essentially... Ah, part 10. Oh, okay. If you wish to incorporate parts of the program, being the Linux kernel, into other free programs with distribution conditions are different, uh, write to the author and ask for permission. <laughs> Uh, for software which is copyrighted by the Free Software Foundation, right to the uh, that, that's not the right clause. Anyway, there's a clause in there that says you can't just mix the things together and it causes all these problems. Right, and the BSD right, license so, doesn't have that clause. Yeah. So if you read the uh, the BSD license, which do they have it on here? I see they have the MIT one on here, but I don't see the BSD yeah. one on here. Surprisingly, there which is. is oh, they do. It is. You just have to get more oh, licenses. more licenses okay. available. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will now read the entire BSD license verbatim. <laughs> Copyright by so-and-so, all rights reserved. Redistribution and use in source and binary forms, with or without modification, are permitted provided the following conditions are met. Redistribution of source code must retain the original uh, above copyright notice, this list of conditions, and the following disclaimer. Redistribution in binary form must reproduce the above copyright notice, this list of conditions, and the following disclaimer in the documentation and or other materials provided with the distribution. That's the whole license. Very simple. The uh, disclaimer at the end is, you know, this software is provided by the copyright holder and its contributors as is, and any express or implied warranties, including but not limited to the implied warranties of merchantability or fitness for a particular purpose, are disclaimed. Uh, in, no event, no, in no event shall the copyright holder or contributors be liable for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, exemplary, or uh, consequential damages, including but not limited to procurement of substitute goods or services, loss of use, loss of data, or loss of profits, or business interruption. However, uh, caused by any of the theory of liability, therefore, in contract, strict liability, or tort, blah, 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 blah. Basically, you can have all the BSD code and do whatever you would like with it except for take the copyright off and please include a copy of the copyright notice in the documentation. And also don't sue us. <laughs> right. Very good. And literally that's it. So, you know, when Sony used giant chunks of FreeBSD to build the PlayStation 4, in the back of the manual and on a little website at sony.jp, you can find a list of the copyright messages off the files that they copied. And that's all they had to do. Uh, and so, yeah, we just bundles that at best, and it's fine. Although, when you're building FreeBSD, there's a big knob called without CDDL that will just avoid building all the CDDL bits like uh, hmm. ZFS and uh, Dtrace if you really don't want them because for whatever reason you don't accept the CDDL license or because you're mixing it with GPL or something. Hmm. But it's the same reason why uh, you know, BSD is trying very hard to get rid of all the GPL bits in the base system so that people can build GPL-free appliances because of the restrictions in the GPL v2 and v3. Jungle Boogie writes in with our next email. He says, hello, an advantage for owning your own domain is that you can create many email accounts and even email aliases that point to one specific account so you don't have to check dozens of different accounts. He says, and asks, is there any advantage to creating email aliases for online services? For example, tarsnap at example.com, mybank at example.com, github at example.com. They would all alias to just chris at example.com. Thanks. What do you think, Alan? Some use there to sort of mask for uh, online services? Yeah, I've been doing that for 15 years. <laughs> Alan says yes, and you basically do for spam control. What's your... What's yeah, your... so that's part of it. Um, so, you know, when I give out, you know... Chris's ribshack.com or whatever, an email address. It's something at my domain. And, and then when I later get spam at that address, I know who sold my email address or who got compromised or whatever. 
And it also helps me you detect phishing attacks, right? Uh, so, you know, when I forget which site it was, it got compromised uh, and they started doing phishing attacks based on it, all those emails went to the specific email alias that's for that service. You also don't need to have your own domain to do this. If you have Gmail, you can use username plus site name. At yeah, I was going to mention Gmail. that. Mm -hmm. um, although, with that one, someone looking at it could maybe figure Some out. Some services don't let you do it, too. I've had services be like, sorry, we don't, let, we don't accept that. Like, yeah, screw well, you. that's just a bad regex in their email validation check. There are probably also the places that wouldn't accept an email at one of the new .xyz domains and so on. Mm -hmm, probably. Uh, VW Bond writes in with some follow-up on an Active Directory alternative that we kind of like, hmm, I know there's some out there. Uh, he says, there's a management solution for accounts and groups, etc. One can use is called Free IPA. I wish I knew about this. Um, it's a Red Hat identity management server. So instead of AD for authentication, Linux guys run Free IPA or IPA version 2 servers. And Red Hat staff recommends uh, not using NIS, NIS anymore. Uh, and... Uh, he says, which, you've all, which you've all been saying for the past few years. So I did a little digging on Free IPA. It's still a very active project. In fact, I even talked uh, recently to a former uh, person who worked at Free IPA, uh, working for Red Hat. So yeah, check out Free IPA if you're looking for something that's sort of pre-baked and ready to be an Active Directory drop-in replacement. I guess that's it. Uh, I don't have any hands-on experience with it, but uh, I don't know. It's sort of kismet. I talked to somebody who had been a developer for it, and we got some recommendations via email. If you have something you'd like to follow up on, just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact and send us in some emails for the TechSnap program. If you didn't hear, hear your email read, well, guess what? We're recording another TechSnap just coming up because it's the holiday week next week. So we'll have another batch of emails just around the corner. So if you didn't hear, your, hear yours answered, check uh, 242, the lucky episode 242, to see if your email mm -hmm. made it into that one. But with emails all done, Alan, it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, so that crazy music means another roundup of stories that just didn't fit at the top of the show, but we still want to give you some links to read on your own after the show. Some of these links came from our subreddit at techsnap.reddit.com. Like the first story. This one harkens right back to our first news story this week. Telegram has cracked down on 78 ISIS-related channels in 12 different languages this week. And they're letting everybody know about it, too. They want to spread the word about this yeah. one. Yeah. And you think about it, in Telegram has how many users? And so that's how many channels? So that's 78 out of how many million channels? Uh, to give like, you a, I don't know how, about how many channels, but to give you an idea, uh, Telegram uh, says as of September, it was delivering more than 12 billion messages each day. Right. So in that case, 78 seems like a really small number. It is. So either there was really no ISIS using Telegram, or their ability to detect what ISIS-related channels are. Like, how do you tell a channel is ISIS-related? To, to me, this makes it sound like, well, these are the ones we know about in some way. We've got to do something publicly because we we're getting beat yeah, all week. It's making a news story about doing something. Let's talk about DDoS and the Internet's liability problem. What's this about? Mm -hmm. uh, this is an article by Paul Vixie, who you know, uh, wrote Bind and, and stuff. It's very famous. Mm -hmm. He was at BSD, uh, EuroBSDCon. Oh. Talk. Anyway, uh, but yeah, it basically talks about uh, distributed denial of service tax and how they become a major threat to the economy. You know, we saw uh, webmail services getting taken out with it the other day, and, you know, I was hit with one this morning. Mm. You know, lots of things. It's basically anybody who's pissed off can pay about 15 euros an hour to hire somebody to attack you, uh, and it'll cost you thousands or tens of thousands plus dollars to, to mitigate it or worse to make up for the lost business or whatever. And there's really not much being done to stop it. You know, ISPs don't take responsibility for all their customers' machines that are uh, compromised and, and are sourcing the DOS attacks, yeah, right? right. And ISPs aren't doing things like we've talked about before, you know, BCP38 of blocking traffic not from your network as it exits your network so that you can't, you know, uh, infected machines can't spoof through IP and stuff. And, and so on, right? So in the world of credit cards and ATM cards and so on, state and federal laws explicitly point the finger of liability for fraudulent transactions towards specific actors, right? It's the bad guy did it, but the bank has to make it up to you, and the bank will deal with prosecuting the bad guy or whatever. Uh, these actors make whatever investments they have to make in order to protect themselves from that liability. Um, you know, even if they feel that the real responsibility for preventing fraud ought to lay elsewhere, right? So the bank thinks it's your fault your credit card got stolen. Right. Uh, but the law says it's the bank's problem. Right. And the bank has to deal with it. So do you know what the bank does? They build systems to detect fraud and stop it. Uh, we don't have something like that on the internet. Hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. The makers of devices that become the botnets, like, say, those Aris cable modems with the predictable password. You know, we don't, no, nobody sues them. Nobody has to make them pay for the DOS stack, right? Or the operators of open servers used to reflect and amplify attacks. Or the owners and operators of networks who would permit source address forgery. You know, like Comcast. Or, you know, none of those bear any of the costs of the inevitable storms of denial of service attacks. And uh, that's the problem that deserves a real solution, right? And so what we need is, you know, when, when you're the source of denial of service attack, it kind of needs to be your fault. And you need to have some level of liability. Maybe not very much to start, and we can amp it up over time, but you know, we need something. You know, if, if a device, network, or server is responsible in any part for denial of service attack that cripples some online service or business, then the maker of that device or the operator of that network or server should be liable for those damages. This means denial of service attack victims will be uh, incented to pay for investigation rather than just defense. Right, figure out who was behind the attack instead of just stopping it or, or waiting for it to go away. Uh, because currently, you figure out who did it, and you're like, well, that's great. I now have some information. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but if you could actually use that to force someone to have to pay you, then it would, you know, just like the banks, all of a sudden, this would become a thing, and the problem would be more solved. They'd be incentivized to fix it. Yes, <clears throat> Exactly. <laughs> Uh, all the manufacturers, the cheap little routers and stuff that are being used in these attacks would all of a sudden sit up and take notice because they, you know, maybe they should have to pay a bond yep. before they, when the device Ooh. gets FCC certified. And if after so many years they're not used in an attack, then they get the money back. Hmm. And if they don't, then that money's used to pay the, the, a pool. It gets divided up between all the victims or whatever. Interesting, Alan. Interesting. Did you? Oh, well, you did. Oh, good. You did. You did catch this one. This one was a funny one. Windows 3.1 <laughs> is still live. It's not dead yet. And it just took out a French airport. Yeah. So it turns out that the uh, weather reporting system at the French airport, I forget which one. I don't know if it's Charles de Gaulle or another one, but at some French airport, still runs Windows 3.1. Yeah. Uh, because the software has never been upgraded. Uh, and uh, to the point where they have to go to eBay to be able to find spare parts. And they're probably paying quite exorbitant rates now because. Three, you know, 486 parts are not going to be easy to come by. Yeah, I just discovered a company, uh, because I was looking for a friend of mine, they have a security system that's managed by, managed by a Windows 95 computer. Uh, and it's a Windows 95 uh, OSR2, whatever they called it back in the day. Yep. And there is a vendor out there who is still trying to make semi-recent computers designed to run Windows 95. Like, you can go buy them from the this. Compatible yes, drivers. yes, it is a thing. Seems and they like pay top that. dollar, Alan, top dollar. Right, so... Is there some physical interface on that machine that's specific? The reason why you couldn't run it's it actually, in the PM? It's actually a laptop with a PCI-MCA uh, uh, yeah. expansion card which connects into the security system for programming. And it manages like the doors and <laughs> the AC yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah. And they've it's a it's a big old Toshiba clunker. Uh, and like now the, the mouse has died on it and all that. It's just a mess. Oh, yes. I don't know. I've seen uh, similar things. Um, the uh, customer relationship management software that uh, a real estate agent I know uses uh, has this like LTP dongle that is for the licensing, right? So it's their copy protection Lovely. System. Yeah, yeah. Have this oh, dongle. Yeah. Well, newer computers don't have LTP ports and also don't run this old crappy like maybe 32-bit software. Right. Maybe, um, maybe 16. <laughs> it was 16 and then they, I okay. think they like, it was 16 and maybe they compiled it as 32 but it was still looked 16. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and yeah, so now they have a cloud version of the software where you don't keep all the information oh, on your computer. Oh. They get it all. But real estate agent is paranoid and won't use it. Yeah. And so still has to keep a you know, Windows XP computer around that will run this old software. So uh, while we're on ours, this story here, an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at Facebook release engineering, an inside look at how the changes it's are made to one of the world's largest websites. Yeah, so uh, this is just an interesting look at you know change management and how they roll it out and... Interestingly, how they use BitTorrent. Uh, which really? Is, uh, this is coming in handy in uh, current lawsuits about you know how anybody using BitTorrent at all is just proof that they're doing piracy. And it's like, well, turns out no, because you know Facebook uses it just to distribute their system images between all their computers. Or, Fascinating. Uh, you know, BitTorrent sync. People use that to back up their computers now or share files. Sure, absolutely. 
And so there's lots of legitimate uses of BitTorrent. Interesting find. That sounds like a good one. Oh, but yeah, this is a big three-page story. Uh, I haven't had time to read it all, but it looks quite interesting. Yeah, something folks can go check out. We'll have a link in the show notes. All right, so this one's interesting. I don't know what to make of it. It's another story from Ars Technica this week. Police body cams found with pre-installed conflicker worm. So is the camera actually like running Windows XP bundled into it, or is it like the management software? I think it is actually the SD card on the cameras, but I'm not sure. Ah, yeah. So the SD cards were set up wi- on a computer, right. That had the Conflicker virus. Because the way the, the way the, the article's written, it says the camera was pre pre installed with Win32 Conflicker, but I think this just means the SD card pre had it had it on there. Probably. And then when you pull the SD card out of the camera and stick it in the yes. computer, yeah. so more than likely the incompetent manufacturer of these was infected. Yeah. 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 Conflickers. <laughs> if, if it was a newer one, you might say, oh, maybe the Chinese supply chain infected right. it or the person is just, uh, you know, somebody in there. But uh, in particular, this because Configure is so old, it just means that their machine, the way they produce these, is just old and infected with Configure. Yeah, researcher iPower looked into it, couldn't get any response from iPower Lab, immediately tried to uh, contact uh, the camera manufacturer on November 11th, 2015. Uh, but they have yet to provide iPower with an official acknowledgement of the security vulnerability. <laughs> and they decided to take the story public to try to put pressure on them. <laughs> yeah. Turns out we have a bunch of Windows XP computers and they're all infected. Our whole network is just infested with conflict. Yeah, yeah. All right, Alan, this next one's a jumble for you. Bypassing SMEP using VDSO overrides from the CSAW Finals 2015 string IPC, as everyone yes. knows. So this is uh, <laughs> from a hacking challenge at a conference. I kind of grokked uh, that, yeah. So, uh, string IPC is a kernel module in Linux. And then uh, SMEP is a technology in the processor that's supposed to stop you from being able to do certain types of exploits. Okay. And so this is a way to get around that. So uh, SMEP is uh, execution prevention, right? It's stopping you from executing code in certain areas of memory. Sure. And so instead what you do is uh, exploiting a small bug in the string IPC module to then write your own code over top of the VDSO part of the Linux kernel. And then when you call into it, it will basically connect out to somewhere and give that person a root shell. And the system thinks it's legit code in that memory space, so it yeah. doesn't know anything. That memory it. space allows writing from the kernel yeah. uh, and executing from using it. Aha. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, so basically, yeah. there's this protection to stop random code from doing this, but there's a uh, you know, certain part of code that's allowed to do it, and so we just overwrite that bit of code and completely get around the supervisor mode execution protection. Now, this next story, it almost sounds like hocus pocus, but privacy advocates are warning about tones that are inaudible to us humans that could link your phone, TV, and tablets and PCs together. Uh, They say privacy advocates are warning federal authorities of a new threat that uses inaudible, high-frequency sounds to track a person's online behavior across a range of devices, including phones, TVs, tablets, and computers. The ultrasonic pitches are embedded into TV commercials or played when a user encounters an ad displayed on the computer browser. Now, interestingly enough about... Yeah, imagine you have this, this software on your phone that you don't know is there, maybe pre bundled by your phone company or by the manufacturer of the phone, or maybe you installed it when you installed some game or something. Or, Alan, something just sort of probably not related at all, but just kind of an interesting thought experiment. Facebook just got busted for the Facebook app for years now, has been silently playing audio in the background to stay alive on the iPhone. So they got around all of Apple's automatic power management and app process killing processes by playing a silent tone when you would look at a video and the thing would just continue to play a silent tone. You close the app, the app runs running in the background. What if it was something like this all along? Yep. Uh, and basically, when it hear, when your phone, when the app listening on your phone hears uh, your TV playing a certain commercial, it now knows you watched that commercial and then will maybe show you and uh, tell that to the website and the website will show you the, an ad for that uh, same product. And now because you've seen it in those two places, there's a higher chance you'll acknowledge the ad and maybe buy the thing. Dirty play, sir. Dirty play. Uh, but also that means uh, if they can do it between your laptop and your phone, they can now have a super cookie and know for sure that that laptop and that phone are the same right. person. At least. Even though technically, if you sit in a coffee shop, they could you could cause great confusion. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, like my, uh, the way my yeah, kids use yeah. devices, who knows what's going on. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> imagine a coffee shop, just random people. Mm-hmm. It's like some random guy's laptop and your phone are now associated in some advertising company's mind. Right. Well, but, uh, I know here I've actually separated my traffic out on a separate IP addresses from my girlfriend's because I started getting ads for feminine products. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I always get, I, st- I, I continue to get ads on like Facebook 
for stuff I've just bought on Amazon. And I, it yes, baffles me. Targeting. It, but it's the worst kind. Like, I, I bought this. Yes, um, if you already bought it, it's, it's because the cookie gets set when you look at the item. And it doesn't seem right. to get unset when you buy yeah. the item. And so I bought and this so connector, and it's like I already own the connector now, and now you're advertising me more connectors. With, uh, Google, I get the same one. With, if, I, if I look at something in Newegg, for a month afterwards, they'll be like, are you sure you don't want to buy that? Are you sure you don't want to buy that? It's like, well, A, either I already bought it, or you know, also I never buy things from Newegg because they're not very friendly in Canada. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan. Well, well yeah. they're not actually in Canada, and they only and then the, I tried to. I bought the first ZFS server there because I didn't know about IX systems. I recall, yeah. And uh, yeah, the the amount of faff I went through was really <laughs> upsetting. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, Alan. That sounds diff- That sounds challenging. Uh, all right, next story in the roundup: mm-hmm. introducing Chuckle and mm-hmm. the importance of SMB signing. I love the fact that this uh, security research company managed to get a dot .trust top-level domain. No That's kidding, awesome. huh? How about yep. that? That is legit. Uh, but yeah, so they've introduced a new tool called Chuckle, uh, which you can use, uh, and they basically talk about the importance of SMB signing. So this is uh, kind of like IPsec, but for Windows. And basically, when you send the uh, SMB messages around, uh, is a way to prove that it actually came from a computer that's part of your domain. And... Uh, you know, servers usually will only accept messages sent by clients that are proving they're part of the domain, but most of the clients don't verify the other direction mm. uh, because you turn that on and it, it, it takes about it eats about fifteen percent of your network performance, and you know if one machine isn't they don't cooperate, and if you have you know something maybe that's pretending to be uh, Windows but isn't, then it all breaks down. Uh, but Basically, what this program can do is if you compromise one machine that has access here, you can then spoof through it so that you can send requests and then get a different machine to sign it for you and then get it accepted by the domain controller and right. so on. Right. But Chuckle is basically this tool you can use to automate the process. Hmm. I so did. between I like Chuckle and too. NetMap, you can find uh, machines that are vulnerable and then exploit them. Oh, it's a Docker story in the roundup. Docker Content Trust gets hardware signing. Three months ago, we launched the Docker Content Trust, integrating guarantees from the update framework into Docker using Notary, an open sourced okay. what? Notary? Okay. So, no. Uh, oh. So, and you know Yubico as well is also getting worked in here. Docker is a big thing for people. Uh, Docker works on the Lumos and it works on FreeBSD and then it uses secure containers and that's pretty good. But on Linux, <laughs> Containers are not <laughs> secure yet, or okay. ever. I'm with something. you. I'm okay. Right. Um, and so, when you're running random people's apps in a Docker, and you don't know that it's, you know, you can't guarantee it's actually going to be isolated from your base system, and somebody won't be able to break out of it. You'd really like to know that this random Docker image you got off the internet with, you know, curl pipe bash, is actually from the person you think it's from. So they built this signing infrastructure so that. When you download the image, you can make sure it actually came from the person you think it came from, and when you get updates for it, that they're from the same person. Uh, but they didn't really have the f- whole key signing infrastructure, and so now they've hooked it up with YubiKey. So basically at the conference, they gave all the people that build Docker images YubiKeys so that they can all sign their Docker images and updates so that when you, the user, grab one of these Docker images, you can be sure that it's not full of fail. I, uh, I I like the integration of YubiKey. That is super cool. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, so you know, I'm, I'm glad you told us how you to really mitigate feel. the problems with running containers on Linux is to at least trust the source yes. of the image for right, the container. Right, 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 right. That is very true. That is, yeah, that is something I would totally agree with. You. In fact, we kind of we actually kind of um, moaned about that a little bit on this week's Linux Unplugged. If people are curious about that. All right. So LinkedIn fixes a persistent cross-site vulnerability. I didn't even catch this one, Alan. What do we know? Yep. Uh, so basically, there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability that could have been used to spread a worm via their help forum or something. Uh, but they fixed it, so that's good. Good. Very good. Very good. All right. Now, while we're still on the topic of Docker, CoreOS launches <laughs> Claire, an open source tool for monitoring container security. And you know, CoreOS did a little survey, and they found that 80% of Docker images stored on the QA service, or Q, I don't know, query service, Q-U-A-Y. It's called Q. Uh, thank you. It's like the thing that a, a ship docks with. Are eighty percent of those images uh, stored there are still vulnerable to the heart bleed heart bleed bug bug? Jeez. Yes, because the say. whole point of containers is that we don't update the package. We don't have to touch it. It's all set. We leave it alone. 
Yes. And so it's all full of old OpenSSL. So Claire from CoreOS can scan, can scan, can, can, geez, I can't talk anymore. Too much tech snapping. Can scan containers that are have vulnerabilities and then alert developers of potential issues. CoreOS is getting this data from its vulnerability databases, like it pulls in from Red Hat, Ubuntu, and Debian. So that's not bad. So this will help a little bit, you know, an extra tool to sit on top of Docker to manage yeah. security uh, issues. Yeah, when I first heard security, I thought it was some kind of active monitor, but no, it's it's basically a replacement for BSD's package audit command, which, you know, you run PKG space audit, and it tells you, here are all the vulnerable things you have installed, and you should fix that. But apparently we need a whole separate app with a logo to do that. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Uh, all right, so then our next story in the roundup, it's way too easy to hack the hospital coming from Bloomberg. Yes. Now, that's a hell of a title. Yeah, so the Mayo Clinic has basically assembled a team of uh, computer people to uh, try to beef up their security a little bit and you know, build things that all hospitals could apply and maybe fix things a little bit, make yeah. it a little harder for the bad guys. Yeah, no kidding, right? Every day. But like they point out, even like printers and copiers that are in offices and hospitals, they all have an operating system on them now. Yes. Right? And that's what we talked about, you know, some of those advanced persistent threats we saw before. It's like what you do is you uh, infect the computers and then you also infect a printer. Mm -hmm. And then when they erase all the computers and they like turn off every computer and erase it all and like burn everything and build, buy all new computers. But and not set them new up, printers. <laughs> and then... Immediately, everything's reinfected by the printer. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, it's uh, like remember when Sony got hacked and they like was, shut down all the computers and everybody had to use pen and paper. For I was going to say something. too. We've also heard stories like of uh, just like the classic, you know, own the HP laser jet uh, that has the super agent laser jet network card in it that hasn't been updated in ages. And yeah, things like or that. play Doom on it <laughs> because it has an operating system. I love that you found this next one. Uh, transparently tunnel your IP traffic through an ICMP Echo. And the reply packets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, every time you send a packet, you send an ICMP echo to a certain machine. And every time you get a packet, it will send an echo reply back to you. And basically, uh, you know, if you happen to be behind a firewall that does allow ICMP, which some do, uh, all should, um, basically you can tunnel all your traffic through ICMP requests. Hmm. There's also a similar one to do it with DNS. Hmm. How about that, Alan? Yep. Uh, I like this one. Two mogul replaced 31 EC2 uh, larges, you know, the X2 large Double editions. Extra large. Yeah. With two bare metal super microservers. How about that? Yes. So this is a presentation from Lisa, the Large System Administrator Conference that was in Washington, D.C. earlier this two weeks ago, one week ago, something like that. Anyway, uh, so first of all, I didn't know two mogul was still around. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they, they had 31 EC2 extra large images. Uh, and yeah, I. You know, there's a reason why Scale Engine runs off a bunch of super micro servers instead of a bunch of Amazon EC2 images. Uh, there's a couple of things, but on it, part of it is that Amazon EC2 2x large images are really not that big. I think you get like 12 gigs of RAM or something. Hmm. Whereas in one of those super micro servers, you could put 768 gigs of RAM. <laughs> yeah, if you have the ability to to host them yourself, you could you know you could definitely dump them uh, like that's you could dump way more RAM in there. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I like this next story. Like, if you want to go uh, bang on something, 15 vulnerable sites to legally practice your hacking skills. 15 different sites you can go bang on. Yep. And, the, and also the damn vulnerable iOS app. That's cool. Yeah, damn vulnerable web app. <laughs> bunch of web apps. And Exploit like me that. mobile Android labs. Game of hacks. Very cool. iGoat. Insecure web app. McAfee hack me sites. It's a good list. Mm -hmm. The Butterfly Security Project. Vinculum. Web goat. Very nice, Alan. Yes. Find a link to that in the show notes. All right, moving right on in the roundup. Uh, media jacking, unintentional photography. What is this? Yeah, so uh, you know how in your browser, when uh, a new like WebRTC site wants to access your webcam, you yes. get this pop-up. Yes. Well, it turns out it might be predictable where that pop-up happens on your screen. And so the real trick hmm. is to not ask for the webcam access immediately, but wait and offer the user a link or a button or something that they want to click on. In that area? And then, no, just on the page, right? Okay. And then as their mouse gets just about there and they're about to click, you pop up that dialogue. And when they click, they hit accept instead of the link underneath on the website. And you take a picture. And then 
that you your website has access to their webcam and you can take video of them. What the heck, Alan? What the heck? That's perverted. Yeah. So it's like, well, I guess it's up to uh, the website. The browsers will just have to make the window pop up in a random place. Or something. I don't know exactly don't how to solve about, this. Exactly. I don't know about that either. That's not so good. Honestly, instead of that pop-up dialogue, it really should be kind of like the old uh, ones for you know the pop-up blocker where it pops up. You know, it, it, the slide down from the top. Yeah. Like it does when uh, when Adobe Flash is blocked or Java. Right. Right. A little slide down just below the URL bar. And yeah. You click it there, and it's always never part of the site itself. I, I, and I thought, maybe it should be like if you've ever noticed the Firefox download thing, the OK button is disabled for like the first one or two seconds, specifically to prevent you from you know you were pressing Enter or it popped up while you were typing in a box and it you pressed the button that made it auto accept. I thought it always does. I'm trying to think of how it does it in Chrome, but yeah, I guess it it always pops up for me when the website loads. But I guess that's just the way they design the site, huh? Mm-hmm. So if they could, hmm. yeah. Yeah, I guess that'd be, you know, that is going to be, the, when you start building that kind of stuff into the web browser, people are going to start figuring out ways to trick people into turning it on so they can yep. take pictures or record audio. Or, or you know what, Alan? Uh, WebRTC and whatnot even allows for local file store to use, web, you know, you can you can set up a, distri- a distribution of uh, browsers running WebRTC as a P2P CDN. So there's all kinds yeah, of things you can do with I it. Think, uh, the, most browsers limit the local storage to like 10 megabytes. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I'm just saying there's all kinds of like interesting little things you could do if you let people turn it on for you. If you could trick them into turning it on, which like our story just we talked about earlier today with the rats and, and using just social engineering to get people to turn that stuff on, they'll go as far as they need to to get it to happen. So yep. we'll probably have future stories talking about that and how somebody got access to something. Alan, is there anything else we want to cover today in episode 241? Nope. All right, well, we will be recording another episode in just a little bit, so if you're watching live, hang out with us. Otherwise, check the calendar for our live shows. We'd love to have you hang out in the chat room. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. You'd chat with us in between segment breaks, help us title the show, and uh, interact with us as we're doing it. Just go to jblive.tv to catch it live. Normally, we're live at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it right there. Won't be live that time next week, but normally that'll be our live time. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week. 